John chapter 1, verse 14. It says, And the word, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And that's who Jesus Christ is. He is the word made flesh. If you go back to the first verse of the chapter, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. The God who spoke the worlds into existence decided to partake of our own existence. He came down to our level in order that he might redeem us and bring us to his level. And so I want to talk about who Jesus is. And for the next few minutes, I want to focus on the sinless humanity of Jesus Christ. We teach and preach that Jesus was God manifested in the flesh. We preach and teach he was the Son of God. But I think we need to give a little more attention to the fact that he was a genuine human being just like us, except he never sinned. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into the glory. I want to dwell on that just a little bit. When the Bible speaks of the word was made flesh, the word flesh in scripture, uh, it can have several meanings. It can refer to... Uh, uh, the, the physical uh, flesh in the sense of meat, eating flesh, eating meat of animals. It can refer to the physical human flesh, flesh and bones. But most often when the Bible uses the word flesh, it speaks of human identity. So when it says the word was made flesh, God was manifested in the flesh, it means more than to say God was in a body. It's really saying God became a human being. God was personified because flesh, and of course, often in the Bible, flesh has somewhat of a negative connotation of sinful flesh. If you're walking in the flesh, that's talking about sinful human personality. Of course, in the case of Jesus, he never sinned. So there's no negative connotation, but there still is the positive connotation of human identity. So when we say that God was in the flesh, it means more than God was in a body. It means God assumed full human identity just like us. And when I say except for sin, recall that when God created Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, he created them in a state of innocence. He did not create them as sinners. So human nature and human identity as designed and created by God was not sinful. It was innocent, pure, and holy. Jesus did not come in the likeness of fallen flesh, but Jesus came in the likeness of the original flesh that God had in mind, that God created. And so we need to understand Jesus is the perfect example of what humans are supposed to be in God's sight. Now, 1 Timothy 3.16 is powerful. It says, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. The word mystery in Scripture refers to a message that was once hidden, but is now revealed. When people t talk about, well, the Godhead is a mystery, uh, I think they're missing the point. Certainly God is infinite, we're finite. There's no way we can comprehend the majesty of God and all the truth that uh, there is about God. So in that sense, sure, God is much greater than we are. God is mysterious in that sense. But God has chosen to reveal himself to us so that we can have a relationship with him. So when it says the mystery of godliness, it's saying something that was hidden in ages past, but now has been revealed to God's people. Now, what is the mystery of godliness? It's not how many gods there are. That's always been clear from the Old Testament all the way through. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. For somebody to say, oh, well, the God is a great mystery. We don't know how many persons there are. We don't know who we're going to see when we get to heaven. They're misusing the word mystery. The mystery is not how many gods. There's one God. 
He's revealed as Father in creation. He came in the flesh as the Son of God. He works in our lives invisibly but powerfully as the Holy Spirit. But yet God, Father, Son, Spirit is one God. That's not a mystery. That's something we can understand. But the mystery is how did God come in the flesh to think of that baby in the arms of Mary as being the son of God, not just the son of Joseph. To think of that baby being God with us. That's incredible. To think of that 12-year-old saying, I must be about my father's business and confounding the religious experts, the theologians of his day, to think of that young man at age 30 being able to calm the storm, being able to feed the 5,000 with five loaves of bread and two fish, being able to raise the dead, and then dying on the cross for the sins of the world. That is beyond our ability to comprehend how the infinite God could come in finite flesh and why He would love us, and why He would lay down the riches of glory and the splendor of glory to identify with us. That's the mystery of godliness. But we can know it and believe it because it actually happened and it's been revealed to us. Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh. God came to be one of us. Oh, what a wonderful, exciting mystery that's been revealed that God identifies personally with you and me. When we think of God, infinite in power and grace and holiness, we say, how can I approach Him? How can I relate to Him? Why would He bother with me? Uh, How could I even understand His will? It seems impossible. Why would He forgive me? And that is what many people of the world struggle with. How could we ever get the attention of the great God? How would He ever care for us? But when we realize God came in the flesh and lived a life among us, then we understand, yes, God knows where we are. God knows what it's like to be flesh. God took the time and the care to live a life like I live. And so the mystery has been revealed. God can identify with us. And therefore we can identify with God. We can come to Him and ask for His help knowing that He understands and that He cares. Praise God. That is the mystery of godliness that God was manifested in the flesh. He was justified or vindicated in the Spirit. By the power of the Holy Spirit, He performed miracles. And ultimately, the Spirit of God raised Him from the dead. If you doubt whether Jesus Christ is real and whether He has power to forgive you, look at the empty tomb. The Spirit of God raised Him from the dead, vindicating Him, showing that He has all power, that yes, He can work in your situation. He can deliver you. Not only does He identify with us in our weakness, but He is able to deliver us out of weakness into strength. He's able to give us victory over death itself. Praise God. Justified in the Spirit. Seen of angels. Seen by angels. Why Why would that be notable? I think it's because the angels never imagined that God would come in flesh. They were familiar with God's holy presence. In whatever way God manifests himself in the spirit realm, they were well acquainted with God's manifestation. But what was surprising, and I would say even shocking to them, can you imagine that baby? That's God. That young man, why would he live for 30 years in obscurity? Why doesn't he take care of things? Why would he hang on the cross and allow them To mock him, doesn't he know that we would come down an instant to deliver him? How could he do that? Can you imagine the angels themselves saying, I didn't realize that God loved these sinful humans so much that he would actually become one of them. He was seen by the angels. Praise God. And then, of course, he was preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. A true human identity. Let's go forward. When we talk about Jesus Christ as God manifests in the flesh, we mean that he, it does include the fact that he had a human body. Hebrews 10, 5, Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. These quotations are from the New King James, by the way. Hebrews 10, 10, By that will, by that will, it's God's will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. 
Now, I said flesh does not relate to the body only, but certainly it does include the body. Jesus was not just an apparition or a ghost. He did not just pretend to be human. You know, there, there is an ancient view, and it's even held today, that somehow Jesus was just had a divine humanity. So this flesh was not real. But I want you to know, he had a real human body that when you cut it, it would bleed. When the stripes were put on his back, there was real pain. There was real suffering. There was real blood. When he was nailed to the cross, there was real death where his spirit separated from the body. There was agony and pain, suffering and death. He did that for our sins. You see, only if Jesus was truly a man, a human being, and only if he truly died, only if he truly shed blood, could he take our place and pay the price for our sins. If he wasn't truly a man, a human, he couldn't have taken the price and paid the price for us. Not only that, I think it's scriptural to say that Jesus was human in soul. Now, I don't say that he had a separate soul, but bear with me for a few minutes. The Spirit of God was joined to a complete human identity. Whatever humans are, Jesus was. Because if he was going to take our place, he couldn't be any less than us. He had to be truly one of us. Now, we have a soul, speaking of human personality, human identity, our feelings, our thoughts. Uh, so Jesus was not just God in a body, but Jesus was God revealed in human identity so that he had human uh, thoughts, human feelings, human emotions, human personality. I would not say separate from God, but I would say the Spirit of God was joined to full humanity. Now, I'll give you scripture for this. In Matthew 26, 38, Garden of Gethsemane, he said to his disciples, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Stay here and watch with me. Now, is that is that just the experience of God? Can you imagine that God could be sorrowful in a human sense, exceedingly sorrowful even unto death, that in a sense, have you ever been, hopefully none of us have been actually suicidal, although maybe without God some have been, but have you ever just felt, I'm so sad, I'm so sorrowful, I'm so full of pain, it just seems like it would be easier to die. Probably all of us have felt that emotional and maybe some even physical pain of saying it would be easier to die. Well, that's a human feeling. But I can't really imagine God saying, I'm so sorry, I just wish I could die. That's not something God feels, but that's something that Jesus Christ felt as a human. The Spirit of God in him did not protect him or did not shield him from every kind of trial or tribulation or test or temptation or suffering that we would have. So there were times where Jesus felt so alone, so troubled, so sorrowful that in a human sense, he could wish he were dead. That's how he could explain that. So that's why I say Jesus was human in soul, because this is not uh, an experience that God experiences because he's God. But this is something that Jesus experienced in his soul as human. Acts 2.31 is another example. The apostle Peter preaching and referring to the prophecy of Psalms, uh, that how that David had prophesied actually about Christ. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This is talking about the experience of death. Uh, the word Hades means the place of the dead. In the King James Version, it's called hell. But the, the thing about it is, you don't know in the King James Version, when you see the word hell, it could refer to several different terms from the Greek. And that is, uh, it could refer to the lake of fire. Uh, Gehenna. But in this passage, it's not referring to the lake of fire, the eternal abode of sinners, but it's referring to the place of the dead. When someone dies in the Old Testament teaching, when someone dies, their body would go to the grave, but their soul, their inward nature would go to Hades, the place of waiting of the dead, waiting for the resurrection where the body and soul would be reunited. 
So what the prophecy of Psalms is saying is that Jesus went through the typical experience of death as every human being would with this one difference. The resurrection was already in view. So while his body went to the grave, it did not start decaying. But the Spirit of God preserved it until the time of resurrection. His soul went to Hades, but he did not stay there. It was a temporary time when he came out of the grave. Soul and body were reunited, and Jesus arose from the grave. But once again, that's a human experience. You don't think of God as going to Hades, waiting in the place of the dead. But Jesus, as God manifested in the flesh, his human soul, I think, was united with the Spirit of God. So that you could say his human identity was joined to the Spirit of God. And then go a little bit further. Sometimes the word spirit is used for that inward nature, soul and spirit. And we won't get into that in great detail except just to say the soul and or the spirit speaks of the innermost nature of human beings. And if you try to distinguish it, you might say that the soul is the human personality, the self-consciousness, where the spirit is the God consciousness, the part of us that relates to God. But for all practical purposes, we think of soul and spirit together as representing the inner nature of a human being. And sometimes the Bible just says the soul. Sometimes it says the spirit, speaking of that uh, innermost being. The point is that Jesus in his innermost being had humanity joined to the spirit of God. So more than just being God in a body, he was God in the full range of human experience. Now let me give you this example in Luke chapter two, verse 40, the child grew and became strong in spirit filled with wisdom and the grace of God was upon him. When it says he became strong in spirit, is that speaking of his identity as God? Can God grow? Can God's spirit grow? Can God's spirit get stronger and stronger? No, God's spirit is always the same. This is speaking in his human life. As a child, he not only grew physically, but he grew spiritually. And then Luke 23, 46, the moment of death. When Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father... Into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. When he says, into your hands I commit my spirit, that's a very human expression, isn't it? At the moment of death, that's something we could say. God, I give myself to you. I commit my spirit into your hands. I know my body is going to go into the grave and decay, but I, I, I believe my spirit will be joined uh, and, and will be in your presence when I die. And so you can say, I commit my spirit into your hands. So Jesus was not speaking as a different God, as if one God was giving himself to another God. But Jesus was speaking in human experience, as all humans should be able to say, God, I give myself to you. I surrender my spirit to you. That's a human expression. What I'm saying is Jesus was human in every way, except for sin. Moving on a little bit further, human mind, Philippians 2, 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Human will, Luke twenty two forty two, in the Garden of Gethsemane again, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Now, that's very interesting, isn't it? When he says, not my will. If you think of him as speaking as a second deity, that is a very strange thing. Can you think of the will of God in conflict? Two wills of God? God fighting against God? One part of God telling another part of God, I have one will, and the other part of God says, no, I have a different will. Whose will is going to trump the other? That would be a polytheistic concept, a, a struggle within the Godhead, that here's Zeus, the king of the gods, saying, no, you're not going to do this. That's not the way it was. There's only one God. God has one divine will and purpose. But here we see Jesus again praying, just as we could pray, and say, in my human feeling, I would like to avoid suffering. In my own flesh, in my thoughts, in my body, I cringe from thinking that I'm going to be beaten and I'm going to be crucified. It's not God having second thoughts. 
It's not God having doubts, but in the flesh, Jesus was reacting like a human would react. And he said, if it were possible, if there were some way to do this plan without me suffering, I really would like that. But nevertheless, not my will as a human, but the will of God be done. And so here we have the human will in submission to the divine will. Now, can you have two wills in one personal being? Yes, definitely. In the case of Jesus, you have clearly, even in our own sense, in a lesser sense, Jesus said to the disciples when he prayed and he got up and he saw them sleeping, he said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So obviously we're not God manifest in the flesh as Jesus was, but even we ourselves can have a struggle of the human will and our own spirit where our flesh wants to do one thing, but our spirit wants to do another. If you've ever fasted, you know what I'm talking about. You could have a desire to fast and draw closer to God, but your flesh doesn't like to fast. Same way with prayer. You may long for a relationship with God in prayer, but after a while, your flesh wants to go to sleep or think about anything except prayer. So even we, in a limited sense, can identify. So it's not unreasonable to say that Jesus could have a human will, yet he submitted his will to the will of the Spirit that was in him, the Spirit of God. And he expressed it by saying, Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Now, sometimes this, what I'm discussing, seems a little shocking to people, but really it couldn't be any other way, could it? If Jesus did not feel human feelings, if he did not have human thoughts, if there was not human suffering or human temptation, then really there was no incarnation. He wasn't really taking our place. It would all be a charade. It would all be an act. But he truly was tempted. Now, you might say, well, how could that be? What if Jesus would have sinned? Well, that's, I think, uh, uh, a hypothetical thought because the important thing is he didn't sin. But I think he definitely was capable of being tempted. Yet at the same time, he knew he was going to resist temptation. So as a practical matter, he wasn't going to sin. But let me put it this way. Just because you know you're going to win doesn't mean you cannot be attacked. So if a five-year-old kid comes up and starts punching on you, you can have pretty much confidence that you're going to win that battle. But that doesn't mean you're not going to get hurt in the process. That doesn't mean it's just a, a, a charade or a fake. You could be severely hurt before you finally subdue this five-year-old monster. So I guess what I'm saying is the fact that you're confident of victory doesn't lessen the reality of the struggle that you must go through. And I would say even we as Christians, we can say, I'm going to be saved. By faith, I know I'm going to be saved. There's no doubt in my mind. I don't get up every morning wondering, am I going to backslide today? A year from now, am I going to backslide? No. It's settled in my mind, not by arrogance or boasting, but by faith. Because I have confidence in God. God is faithful to sustain us. If we'll keep walking by faith, we have assurance of salvation. You and I can have confidence. We can say, I'll meet you over there. I'll meet you in the morning beside the eastern gate, the song says. How can we be so confident? We're not confident in ourselves, but we're confident in God. So we can feel that. But does that take away the agony that we go through when we're tempted and tested? Of course not. The fact that we're determined to go to heaven doesn't minimize the struggle that we face when we're tempted. I would put it like this. If you would if you would try to imagine... Jesus succumbing to sin. You could not imagine him just living his life as a sinner and the Spirit of God departing from him because that would reduce him to no more than you and I. We have God's Spirit in us, but we can go into a life of sin and walk away from God's Spirit. But you would have to imagine, if if you could imagine that Jesus would try to sin, you, you would have to imagine immediately the incarnation would cease because the Spirit of God would not allow sin Uh, to pollute his holy presence. 
you would have to imagine Jesus dying on the spot. But the point is, Jesus did not sin. And he was faithful, but he was tempted. And this is what I think is important in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Jesus endured genuine temptation in every way that we do. You might say, well, he was never in the situation I'm in. Well, of all the billions of people on planet Earth, obviously we're not saying Jesus lived everyone's life. But what we are saying is every kind of temptation that humans go through, Jesus went through that. If you look at it, you could probably categorize all temptation and all sin under the three headings of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. If you think about it, everything that you struggle with is under one of those categories. Well, Jesus faced the temptation of the devil in the wilderness in those very areas where the devil tried to get him to turn stones into bread tried to appeal to the lust of the flesh. The devil tried to get him to look at all the kingdoms of the world and say, all these will be yours if you'll serve me and worship me. He tried to appeal to lust of the eyes. The devil tried to get him to jump from the pinnacle of the temple and uh, show that he was a son of God by the angels miraculously catching him and uh, doing supernatural feats, not for the will of God and not for helping souls, but just for ego. And he was trying to appeal to the pride of life. Of course, Jesus resisted each of those temptations. And there was the supreme temptation of the Garden of Gethsemane where he faced death itself. And he had to make a choice. Am I going to endure suffering and even death and for the will of God? So whatever suffering you may go through physically, mentally, or spiritually, Jesus went through that kind of agony uh, praying until he sweated, as it were, great drops of blood. Can you honestly say whatever, whatever sickness or illness or psychological or emotional upheaval you've gone through, can you say it was any worse than a man praying in the Garden of Gethsemane knowing he was getting ready to be arrested and he was getting ready to be beaten and he was getting ready to be crucified? I mean, he knows what physical agony is. He knows what emotional agony is. And just think about it. His best friends all forsook him. His followers, one of them betrayed him. Another one denied him. All the rest fled. So if you want to talk about being betrayed, you want to talk about your friends failing you, you want to talk about divorce or people leaving you, he was never married, but the same kind of agony in personal relationships he underwent that in a human sense now we don't know what happened to joseph but it, it seems that joseph must have died somewhere early on in christ if not his childhood then his young adulthood because on the cross mary his mother was there and he turned to john and said Be, uh, son behold your mother in other words take care of your mother and john took her to his home from then on till the day of her death. Well, if Joseph had still been living, that wouldn't be necessary. So, so he knew what it was like to lose his earthly father. He knew what it was like to have to say goodbye to his mother. He knew what it was like for his own people, the nation of Israel, to reject him. He knew what it was like to be mocked. He knew what it was like to, for his own brothers to say, you're crazy. You know, we don't believe in you. You're, you're crazy. You know, your mind's messed up. And so whatever kind of temptation you could imagine yourself going through, Jesus had a similar type of situation so that the Scripture could say, in every way that you and I have been tempted, Jesus has already been there, and he overcame. He was tempted, but he didn't sin. Therefore, he can sympathize, he can understand. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7 through 8 who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear, though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. That's something that Jesus suffered. He learned what it was like to be humble. He learned what it was like to be obedient. 
He learned what it was like to surrender his will. He learned what it was like to cry, strong cries, and yet, seemingly, his prayer was not answered, at least not the way he wished in the flesh. You know, he cried out, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Well, that part of the prayer was not answered. But he prayed, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. That part of the prayer was answered. But he knows what it's like to cry out and say, God, deliver me from this. And God says, no, I'm not going to deliver you from this. He knew what it was like. In all of that, he didn't sin. Hebrews 4.15, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. 1 Peter 2.22, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. 1 John 3, 5, And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. Romans 8, 3, For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son, and notice this, in the likeness of sinful flesh, on account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. So he was in the likeness of us as sinners. But yet, instead of falling into sin as we have, he condemned sin. So there was no sin in him. In short, what this means, the Bible speaks of him as the last Adam. The first Adam was the first representative of the human race. He was the father of the human race. And because of his sin, he led us as a race into sin. Jesus comes as the new representative of the human race. Again, as I said, as Adam was in the beginning, created without sin, so Jesus comes as without sin. And he becomes the new representative of the human race. So if we follow after him, then we can inherit everything that Jesus Christ won. So we have a choice of following after the first Adam or following after the last Adam. And notice I've got some scriptures here, Romans 5, 19. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. That's the obedience of the cross. Romans 8, 29, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. In other words, God has a plan of salvation. His plan is for the church to become like Jesus. So God's plan is that we would not follow in the footsteps of Adam who sinned, but we would follow in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. And just as Christ won the victory over sin and over death itself, so it's God's will for us to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. So that after the flesh, in the natural sense, he becomes the first of many. One of these days when we get to heaven, we'll see Jesus in his glorified, immortal body. But guess what? We will be like him. We will also have a glorified body, an immortal body. We will have no sin. We will be completely delivered from sin. We'll be delivered from sickness and death, from sorrow, from tribulation, from trial. And Jesus won't stand alone, but he'll stand as the first of a new race, so to speak, of human beings redeemed. By the power of God. Amen. That's our future. And Romans, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 45. And so it is written. The first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Verse 47. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. Verse 49. As we have born the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. So we have a choice. We can follow after our old father Adam and end up in death and destruction. Or we can follow after Jesus Christ, the new Adam, the last Adam, and we can inherit eternal life. In fact, and I'm coming to a close here, it's necessary for us to acknowledge the true humanity of Jesus. Just as it's necessary for us to acknowledge that Jesus is truly God. 
So we must also acknowledge that Jesus is truly human. In 1 John 4, 3, every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. Why is it the spirit of Antichrist? Antichrist literally means against Christ, opposing Christ. If you deny that Jesus came in the flesh, you're opposing the very reason for Jesus being born. If you oppose that Jesus came in the flesh, you're denying the atonement for your sins. How can you be saved if you don't believe there was someone who died in your place? So we must protect the true humanity of Christ. Now, we as apostolic Pentecostals of one God believers, we're, we are very fond of saying Jesus is our Lord. Jesus is our Savior. Jesus is the one true God. He is the mighty God. And we rejoice over that. And well, we should. But if we're not careful, we can neglect the other side. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the sinless man who died for us. We need to treasure that as well. Don't let anyone take that away from us, that Jesus died for me. Jesus shed his blood for me. Jesus identified with me so that I could identify with him. He knows my weaknesses. He knows my sorrows. He bears my weaknesses and my sorrows on himself. He's taken them unto himself to redeem me. Praise God. Here's the point. Only as a human could he shed blood for the remission of sins. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Hebrews 9, 22. Only as a human could he be our substitutionary sacrifice. That means he took our place. Only as a sinless human could he be our kinsman redeemer. After the example of the Old Testament, if uh, someone was enslaved, a near kinsman could come and buy them out of slavery. He, as our brother, has the authority to buy us back out and redeem us and restore us to God's intended purpose. And I will close with this scripture, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 through verse 18. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. In other words, he didn't come as an angel because angels didn't need his help. He came in the seed of Abraham as a descendant of Abraham because he needed to give assistance to the descendants of Abraham. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. Let's stand tonight. And I hope from this lesson you get this final point. Since he has taken on our nature, he was able to fight the devil on our territory and win. Think about it. He already kicked the devil out of heaven long ago. But when the devil started deceiving us, Jesus came down on the devil's turf and beat him in his own territory. He was saying, I don't have to be in heaven to beat him. I can beat him here on earth. So you and I might say, well, we don't have power over the devil. That's true in our own flesh but jesus christ won the battle for us on our own territory so if you'll have faith in jesus you can share in the victory that jesus won over the devil right here on planet earth since he was tempted in every way like us he knows how to help us when we're tempted since he suffered like us and even more than we've suffered he knows how to assist us he knows how to aid us. And so we can come boldly to the throne of grace and say, Lord, I need your help. Acknowledging that he understands exactly where we are. He is moved with our, with compassion when he sees our great needs. And so we can have great assurance and confidence when we pray. 
And that's why we use phrases like, we plead the blood of Jesus. What in the world does that mean? He shed his blood for us. So we're not saying, oh God, way up there, unknowable, inscrutable, invisible. I don't know if you can hear me or if you do, if you even care about me, but please help me somehow. That's what pagan religions do. But we can say, Lord, I know you love me because you came in the flesh. I know that you care because you are beaten with stripes on your back. You are crucified. The blood was shed for me. And so therefore, Lord, I plead the blood. I call upon you and your shed blood. I need your help today. And there's something powerful about saying, I plead the blood of Jesus Christ. I call upon the name of Jesus Christ. And I want to close here tonight. I told you that it seems like there's just been unusual series of circumstances against our church, against uh, me and the different things that we've had to deal with. Even our building program, it seems like one hurdle after the other. But there's something about saying, Lord, you know exactly what you're going through. You've been through every struggle, and you know what we face better than we know. And so, Lord, I plead the blood of Jesus. Just as you agonize in the Garden of Gethsemane 2,000 years ago, whatever struggle we're going through, I know that you're right by our side. And so I plead the blood of Jesus. I call on the name of Jesus. I come to the high priest. I know that he will represent us in the presence of God. Amen. If you have a personal need tonight, this is an excellent time to call upon Jesus Christ. In fact, if you want to come to the front, I encourage you to do so. But I also encourage you, maybe there's someone nearby. If you feel comfortable doing that, why don't you just get close next to that person and let's pray for one another. Can we do that for a, a moment or two? And if you want to come forward for special prayer, repentance, or you need a laying on of hands for healing or deliverance, feel free to come. But as uh, we sing, as the musicians uh, sing and lead us in worship, I want us to pray for one another right now. I want us to pray for the church and the building program. I want us to pray for our leadership that God would give us grace that God's grace would be sufficient here in 2009. Hallelujah. Let's touch the throne of grace. Let's go to our high priest. Let's call on the name of Jesus. Let's plead the blood of Jesus. Shall we do that tonight? Hallelujah. Hallelujah.